Hi everyone, welcome to our UX Design as a Job webinar at WiseLine Academy and thank you very much for being here today and for taking the time to participate. My name is Laura Perales, Academy Program Coordinator. For those who haven't heard about WiseLine or WiseLine Academy before, let me do a very quick introduction. WiseLine is a software development and design services company with operations in the United States, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and Spain, with six years of experience and more than 700 employees worldwide. We started as a product company and gradually migrated to the services once we realized that we could help other high growth companies to build better products faster through our different disciplines, such as technical writing, user experience, project management, um, SRE, quality assurance, etc. cetera. Um, WiseLine is a trusted ally of brands such as National Geographic, Shape Security, and the Washington Post. And as part of our learning and development culture, WiseLine motivates all its employees to learn by teaching, which means sharing with the internal and external community the knowledge and the experience that we generate day by day, contributing to everyone's professional growth. And we do this through Wisen Academy and its free educational programs such as workshops, talks, and certifications about today's most high value skills in tech in each discipline we have, such as this workshop prepared by one of our UX experts Clara Valderas. Thanks in advance, Clara, for the dedication and for sharing your knowledge. Please um, follow us on Wiseland Academy, sorry, academy.wiseland.com or on social media through Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube as Wiseland Academy and take advantage of everything we prepare for you. And last but not least, enjoy the course, try to be focused, ask as much as you want about the topic and do some networking. This space was created for you, okay? So thanks again, and Clara, the mic is all yours. Thank you very much, Lau. Um, okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Clara Valderas. I'm very excited to be here today. And I am actually wearing the same t-shirt, so you, <laughs> you will all know that it's the same person. Um, so today I'm going to share with you some of um, a little bit of my job, which is UX designer, and I, I love it so much. And here are also some of my passions. I really enjoy music. I love art and craft, and I just um, love and enjoy nature. So about this session, I, I, I want to start with some uh, guidelines that will help us uh, have a really good webinar today. Uh, please turn off your microphone to avoid ha having noise as in the background. Um, you can raise your hand if you'd like to say, say something. Uh, we are going to have this questions and answer section at the end, but feel free to interrupt if there's something that you would like to, to share with the rest. Uh, let's use the Zoom chat for underground communication. So uh, as we go through the content, I will be asking you some questions and I would really like uh, to see you participating in there. You can also share any thoughts or any questions. And here in the room is uh, Elba Ornelas. She is going to help me um, keep track of those questions so we can uh, put them uh, in a parking lot. And this parking lot will help us uh, have a, a real nice discussion at the end. And finally, smile, the session will be recorded. So uh, let's begin with introduction. I want to ask this by asking this question, what is your current job? And I would really appreciate if you could use the Zoom chat to just put there, what is your current job at this moment? Uh, where are you working on? It could be just the job title. I don't know if you are, for example, um, a psychologist or if you are an industrial designer. I would like to read a little bit of that. Okay, so we have industrial designers project managers, software engineers, developers, developers, that's good. I used to be a web developer. Um, okay, there's a student from New York, welcome here. 
uh, UX UI designer, so we have already people who are in the field. Interactive designer on information architecture. Oh, on in artificial intelligence, okay. And we have also senior UX designers. That's really great. I'm curious about that. Okay, thank you so much. Now I'm going to um, change a little bit the question uh, to this one. What do you do the most of the time you are working? Okay, you can just um, write anything in there. Are you making phone calls? Are you writing emails? Um, attending meetings? What do you do? Answer emails, okay? That's a good one. I guess you're all <laughs> kind of uh, having some thinking in there, okay. Emails, meetings, solving problems, meetings, making design proposals, teamwork, research, learn, design. Okay, so that is interesting, really interesting to me, because actually I can see that most of the things that I do as a UX designer are things that you are already doing in your job. Okay, of course, web developers are coding. All right, now, um, thanks for sharing that. I actually asked this question to my mom and some friends and relatives that are close to me because I was curious, as I have been in the industry of user experience for around eight years, I thought that it would be an easy question for them. Uh, so I, I went with my mom and, and my friends and I, I asked them, well, what, what is my job? How would you describe it? And here are some of the answers I got. Uh, it was pretty hilarious. So I have, you improve web pages, which is okay, not that far. You work on pajamas and design websites. Uh, you analyze people, you organize teams to execute projects. That's, that's a good one. Uh, and the broad, of course. You code and design solutions for companies. Uh, I, I'm not coding anymore, but the solutions part is interesting. You make companies grow. That's actually one of my favorites. And you travel and visit clients, which is kind of true. So as you, as you can see, there is, um, <laughs> there is no pattern here. Well, people, people, they are talking about me uh, getting to work with other people and doing some stuff here and there, but I wouldn't use any of these descriptions to actually explain someone what do I do in my job. So this is our trip today. I'm going to start by talking about UX first, and I am going to do this by using terms we are all familiar with. So we won't have any problem at, um, you know, using this um, uh, strange words in the industry or or this UX, UI, um, we are not going to use those abbreviations for now because I want you to get to the essence of what is UX first. After that, we're going to talk about what is UX in the industry. We're going to show some, some graphs and numbers out there. And after that, we're going to cover with the UX designer, how, how does he or she look like, and what, how is a day in the UX life. We're going to finish our session by having some testimonials of people who are currently in the field of UX. And um, finally, we're going to have this questions and answers section. So I hope you enjoy this trip. Okay, so what is UX? I'm going to uh, start this part by asking you this question. How do you make decisions? Um, I wanted to use this uh, like that because decision is something we are all making every day. And it is not necessary for you to write your answer. I just wanted you for you to take a second and think about it. And most of you, I'm sure, will get to something like this. So when we are using, um, when we are making decisions as users, this is what will happen unconsciously in our minds, okay? So we are going to analyze the cost and the benefit. And we're going to compare cost against benefit. Finally, if this, um, if this cost is bigger than the benefit we're going to receive, then our decision might be not to do that action. And it could be any kind of action. So we're making decisions um, 
that are very small, for example, opening your uh, email inbox, that is a decision. But it is also a decision if you decide, um, for example, to migrate to another city or to pick a professional career. Those are decisions you are making. And this is what happens. So let's think about what happens when a user is in front of a website, it could be Amazon. And it is an e-commerce platform. So he's thinking of purchase something. And let's think what the cost would be here. So we have effort, of course, that's part of the cost. We have time because he has to invest time into going to the website, searching for the item, uh, adding it to the shopping cart. The, t the money, of course, because most of the items out there in Amazon are not free. And of course, we have ne negative emotions as well. Why? Because if we are purchasing an item in a physical store, um, Perhaps we will just review that everything is okay before we leave the store and then we get to our homes and we have already the item there. Uh, but when we are purchasing online, it, it's different. In that case, we might be afraid that it might not be arriving to the, to the right direction, it would not arrive on time, or they might send uh, the incorrect item. So those are negative emotions that are part of the cost of purchasing online. And of course, other things. So um, in other things, um, it could be everything. For example, when we go to the doctor and we, um, we, we want to know if we are ill or how, how can we be, um, for example, recovered from an illness. In those cases, a part of the, the, the cost might be pain, okay? That might happen, but what we were going to receive in exchange of that pain is information that will help us be healthy. Um, what other thing we can have as, as a benefit, for example, um, in this Amazon example, we have product. We're going to receive a product. We're going to receive a service as well. If, for example, if we are ordering something through Uber Eats, we are going to receive something there. And of course, we will have time as part of um, the benefit because we're saving time by receiving that service um, in our homes. Uh, positive emotions as well. We are going to see a little bit of that in a while and other things. Now, if we th take a look at these um, elements here as part of the cost and part of the benefit, um, what, would you what, what do you think that is, um, or which items do you think that are the most difficult to change when we are in the business world? Those would be these ones, okay? Because if you go to a client and you tell them, hey, yes, I am a UX designer, and um, you know what, your, your products are too expensive, you have to lower the price. Or if you tell them, you know what, uh, you need to um, just, um, increase the amount of product you are giving to customers because they are not satisfied. If you tell them to a client, of course they will be saying, no, I am not changing that because that is part of, of their business and that is part of their revenue uh, strategy. Um, however, there, is some, um, there are some things we can change. We can actually modify here. So we can balance this in a different way and we can have the cost reduced and the benefit increased. So first I'm going to talk about reducing the cost. And for this, I want to introduce you to this term, which is usability. I'm sorry, I told you that I would not be using any technical terms, but this is a must. So usability, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with it already. And this is a picture I really like to explain this. Um, this is what happens when design this is the, the, the work a designer did. He talked of the people who would use this walk, walkway to get here, but people will use the, the road that is more effective for them and they afford less option. They will just go straight because that requires less time and less effort. And that is the magic of usability. That is what will happen when we add usability to our products and services. And time and effort will be reduced. So that way, without touching any of the benefits or, or even not touching the money part, um, 
we are having users uh, to make their decisions easier um, and of course to use our product or service. Now what happens when usability is deficient? A number of things can happen then. I'm pretty sure that some of you have struggled with this one. Uh, having this pull and push in the doors when we go to the OXO store or to a bank, um, we might be struggling there. And I want to show you this quick video that is a funny one of a person who is struggling with that also. We're building systems. Unexpected opportunity. I'm sorry, and I was talking a minute. Still not been caught. Okay, I, I'll just do a little recap over here. What is happening here is that uh, this man entered the, the bank because he wanted to rob the bank. And once he's in the inside, he <laughs> the, the alarm is activated and he wants to run away. But he didn't know how to open the door because he has trouble with the push and pull thing. And by the time he's waiting for the police to arrive, a person enters the bank, a customer, and at that very moment, his lock changes and he is able to run away. This is another funny example. Uh, this happened in this Miss Universe contest. Um, and this man here makes a mistake and he pronounces the name of the incorrect person when he was about to sell out the winner. And some people have found the space to analyze it from a usability point of view. And we have several um, things to notice here. For example, uh, the first of them is that we as people are used to read from top to bottom and from left to right. And what happens here is that this information will be um, more visible than this one because of that. The second thing is that we have the number one in here and we immediately do the association with the winner because it says first. And third, um, the way this card is designed, this man was probably covering this, um, this part here with his thumb. Um, so he might not have visibility of this at all. Now, in the business world, 69% of the e-commerce visitors abandon their shopping cart. Um, that is a statistics that came from this usability report from four years ago. And here were the causes. So this, this, um, this was a survey for a large uh, sample of users. And which one would, would you say that are uh, related to usability? Here's a hint, navigation usability. So yes, that's definitely one. But the answer would be this one. Because if a person didn't find what she or, or she was looking for, that might be a findability problem. And findability is given by information architecture in a website. A lack of variety of products and product availability, those are things that we might be able to, um, we might be able to manage. For example, if we ask the user to input his or her email, and then we'll, we'll let him or her know when the item arrives or when the item is available on stock. That's a way to manage those situations. And lack of product information, that is also one that we might cover with UX. Because at the end, we are providing value by informing the user, uh, giving them information they need to make their decisions easier. Now, this is an example that is not that funny because it's, it's, it's real. Um, this airplane crashed near England in 1989. And the reason for this was the board. So at, those, uh, at that time, the board used to be um, analog. And 
it was updated so it would be now digital. Now, in the analog board, it was very easy for the pilots to see the pointers, which are here. But in the digital one, pointers are not visible enough. So this, this pilot um, didn't notice that something very um, important was going on with the gas supply of this aircraft. And unfortunately, he crashed. It also happened, for example, with aircrafts of the NASA. And here we can see an example of why usability is not limited to websites. It happens also with uh, PowerPoint presentations, which was the case. So in, 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 this, um, in this example, um, this was a report that was generated based on the results of an evaluation of this aircraft. And one of these um, pieces of information, you know, I, I'm not an expert and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I'm not going to, to, to explain about it, but I, what I know is that one of these pieces of information uh, was very important and could have avoided the disaster. But the person who created the report in PowerPoint put an animation on it. it. It was a spinning animation. So by the time that they exported it to, to PDF, the animation was lost. And the information, the, the critical one, was no longer um, you know, visible enough. This was the information. So after all these examples, we can uh, easily conclude that usability matters. And in other words, it's talking about technology not only being useful, but also usable. Because it is going to be used by human. And in the way that we are able to go from this to this, then human um, will enjoy uh, the technology that we produce and will have a more satisfactory experience. Now, what about UX? So let's remember this uh, illustration we had over here. And we had this, what happens with usability. Now, when we take this to another level, when we have user experience in the formula, then we can go here. And as you can see now, information and positive emotions increase the benefit, while negative emotions are decreased, reducing the cost. No one will forget a good experience, that's for real. And of course, no one will forget a bad experience. So I invite, I invite you all to close your eyes for some seconds and try to remember the last bad experience you have had in your life. It could be any kind of experience with a product or service. Let's think, for example, of a bank. It could be an airline. It could be whatever, um, Uber Eats, for example. And I'm pretty sure that most of you will remember with detail what happened then. So what can we do as UX designers? Well, first, we are talking about reducing the pain points. And second, increasing value. So we help our customers do this. Reduce the effort perceived by their users and customers and increase the perceived value. This is the core. This is the essence of what we do as UX designers. How are we going to do that? I'm going to show you some few examples. Um, so one of the main pain points when using a new platform or a new app application or something is uh, the onboarding process. Because we're learning to use something we are not familiar with. So one of the, the ways we reduce user pain points is by providing these easy guides and tutorials um, that are um, showing the user in a, in a visual way how to use it. The video game industry is one step ahead. They, they have done things like this. This, is, this was a popular game very, some years ago. It's Angry Birds. And what they did was to uh, provide these short, um, very short hints. Um, and they are not showing this all at once. So as you go improving and you go playing, it will be showing one and then another one. So it increases your retention of how to do it. Another typical pain point is the waiting time. Um, you are all familiar with this, which is a loader icon. And some, uh, some people noticed uh, that a progress bar would, would be uh, 
better because now we have an idea of what is the the percentage of our progress and the also the the velocity of it so i i can know if i can go and get a cup of coffee while this this is uploading so this is better um then this is a platform uh, when you are purchasing in playstation you can actually while you are waiting you are here having some um uh, other other games that are suggested that you can review and also in in starcraft this this video game also you can actually see the intro as you are waiting for uh, the the game to be installed in your console so time is relative and also when something went wrong it, it can be because of an error from the side of the technology or an error from from the humans um, there are ways to manage it in a way that they they have an exit door to that. So here something went wrong, but we are giving them options. You can view this, the status page, you can let them know as well. Um, now I'm going to show you some examples of how can we increase the perceived value. So here, for example, we have an app. I'm sorry because it's in Spanish, the example, but basically what I want to highlight here is that um, it will provide you with information that is relevant for you at a relevant time. This is a, uh, an app for uh, save money. So here you have uh, information that will uh, help you um, keep motivated um, because it will tell you about how, how much time are you, uh, have you been saving the money and what do you have now. This is also a way of increasing perceived value. So this is an app, uh, Duolingo, which helps us uh, learn uh, a new language. And this, um, cre this creates, uh, with gamification, that sense of accomplishment each time that you practice, you do your daily practice. Um, so you will hear this nice noise uh, uh, because you, know, you, you have um, reached your goal of the day. And it will also provide you with valuable information that will keep you engaged with it. I'm sorry about this is also in Spanish, but it's Spotify. So what happens here is um, we are getting also uh, personalized information. So it, here we can see uh, that it will suggest, make some suggestions to me based on the music I have been listening to. Um, this will also uh, create up a playlist just for me. And that way it, it feels like it is personalized or customized and I, I perceive that as a value, of course. Personalization is also used a lot in the industry of games, video games. Here we have another one. Um, this is the Pokemon Go app. Um, and what it's using is this uh, feeling of surprise or uncertainty, which we value a lot also. Uh, so it, it actually made people go out of their homes and walk kilometers because they wanted to see what was inside of the egg. And so that is also something that people value um, and they realized that and they are doing things about it. Other thing that we value is that uh, when things are rare or they might just um, go away at any minute. And despegar.com uh, creates this uh, sense of scarcity here by telling you these two last, um, these are the last seats um, and you might lose this if you don't buy it right now. That's what they are saying um, implicitly. Another way to increase the value is um, by providing users uh, this feeling of having a reputation. So for example, in in this platform, which is um, in this in this platform, which is uh, uh, CM as um, from Trips, uh, Trip Advisor. I mean, you can have your reputation increased by writing reviews. So as you go and, and writing reviews, you will be leveling up your level here, and then you might be recognized as someone 
who is, uh, okay, you're not anyone out there writing a review, you are a level six critic. And socialization is also an example. And this is very used, you know, like uh, to have this way to share with your friends what you are doing or in social media. And this game here, which is showing you how your friends are in the board compared to you. Now, I would like to share with you this video, but I'm going to start, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to share again because I would like you to hear my audio. Okay, here we go. So um, this is an example of how we can use several of the items we mentioned before to increase the experience of customers. In this case, uh, this is an airline. And this was a strategy they, they did to um, change those pain points of people being alone in Christmas in, an, in, in this um, traveling situation. And then um, making this a good, uh, a good experience for them by using socialization and by using surprise. And I'm pretty sure that this was worth it in a way that it will um, be um, remained alive in the memory of people much more than you know this um, usual publicity are, um, might might um, might be. So. Uh, I'm, I won't going to make a pause because I, I found this really interesting question in the chat about the context. So yeah, that's true. Um, when we are designing these interfaces um, and we are thinking of usability and also user experience, the context is really, really important because it's not the same to have a user um, in front of a computer as a laboratory than seeing how they are using that or how are they doing that same task uh, in their in their mobile phones while they are in a supermarket or in a crowded place or before they are um i don't know uh, like um about to travel or something like that and yes we're going to talk a little bit about that too so at this moment um we are not only talking about useful and usable we're talking also about enjoyable. And there is where user experience comes in. It's about all the perceptions and the emotions. Um, so um, yeah, I agree. Now, the difference between user experience and a customer experience is that user experience is covering one single point of interaction, while customer experience is covering all points of interactions within the brand or the company, the product and the service and the person that is using them. And yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot for sharing all your thoughts and, and comments. So let's, let's proceed. Now we are here. I have some questions uh, for us to reflect a little bit. Is it possible to have good usability and 
core user experience, what do you think? I'm reading a yes over there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, we could have uh, an, a product that is really easy to use, but the value that provides to the user is not enough for them to keep using it. So positive emotions might be um, not enough or negative emotions might still be high. So yes, the, the answer is yes. Now, is it possible to have poor usability and good user experience? What do you think? Okay, I'm finding also yes as the answers. Yes, but not that often. I, I think that's, um, that's a good one to think. Um, you know, my initial answer would be no, because it's difficult to think that a person is really going to um, enjoy using a product that is so hard to use. So usable, is one of, of, the, uh, of the parts or the steps to, to make some, um, some product a good experience um, one. And in that, in that, in that uh, sense, we have usability of one of the areas of user experience. Now we have this one. Are usability and user experience limited to the digital world? No, that's a huge no. And this is the first answer to the question, a question I get very often um, when people are thinking of switching their career to UX and they say, um, do I, um, am I supposed to have studied something related to information technologies? So the answer is no. Okay, so after this, uh, what we're going to do now is to take a look at what UX is in the industry. And I'm going to show you this uh, brief timeline of how this uh, conception of UX has evolved and from 1940 to our days. So just as context, 1940, let's think of this World War number one. And this statement, usability matters, that came right after that because this was an era in, in which aircrafts were being used, you know, for the war and the engineers that were working on it suddenly m noticed that, of course, it was um, more difficult to recover from a disaster that happened once the, an aircraft crashed than when a car crashed. And at that moment, they were designing technology and they were worried of finding the good people to use that technology. And suddenly they identified um, this element of usability that would help them uh, make technology just easier for people and save a lot of money through that. So by the end of World War I, the first two usability laboratories were created. Now, what happened in, this, in the next years is that UX will, can remain as a esoterical field in the industry until 1980, where we had the PC revolution. And at that very moment, um, engineers noticed of something really relevant in the history of technology that it laptops or I mean PCs were going to be used by regular or by, by common people. So at that point, usability became even uh, more relevant. And then some years after that, um, actually in 1983, Don Norman wrote the first book that was uh, about user-centered design. And some years after that, the industry just noticed this. And there is not only about usability. It's not only that what makes um, technology successful. So in 1993, Nielsen used this term for, for, for the first time, user experience. And then we had the web revolution and this uh, dot com uh, phenomenon. And now we are having this question, what is user experience? Isn't that visual design? Now companies knew that it was relevant and everyone started talking about this, um, but it was not clear for them which was the profile of the people who were doing this. 
So who would they be hiring? A visual designer, an industrial designer? And then in 2010, finally we found this spot, which is UX UI designers. And this is a sweet spot because until now we are finding these job titles, UX UI designers, even when we know that they uh, are different disciplines, but by that time um, we were already finding this as a job title per se, which was a huge thing. And now where we are is in a place where the industry say, okay, um, we need them. User experience is, is now recognized as a huge discipline which has different specialties. And now we are aware of the importance of having it when we are building products and services. So now we have this which says, okay, we need them. Let's bring some of them and let's bring them quick. Now the growth in UX is still to come. I'm going to show you some graphs here. And uh, this was taken from a very interesting article from Nielsen Norman Group. UX professionals in the world from 1950, this is how they have increased until these days. And this is a forecast of how it will be continuing to increase in the next years. So um, this is the logarithmic, uh, a logarithmic scale. This is the linear scale. So we can see that the growth is actually exponential. And this means that um, by 2050, 100 million of professionals uh, will be doing UX design out there. And we would think, isn't that too much? So this is the answer of Jacob Nielsen. He says, it's completely realistic to expect that 1% of the population to work on figuring out what should be designed and then designing those products. And then the remaining 99% of the people can then work on building, selling and servicing what we have designed. So it makes all the sense. This is an interesting article also by Stephen Mait. And it says companies are still defining each role differently, but this capture about 85% of the design job openings on Indeed and LinkedIn. Um, so what about the numbers? So this would be the average salary of UX designers around the world. Um, we have four levels here. Let's say that for an entry level UX designer, less than a year, um, this would be the average in the United States, 62 and 500 around that US dollars per year. Um, then for the UK, a little bit more than 26,000 pounds. In India, 441 um, and uh, 375 rupees. And in Mexico, we have it per month, is uh, around 15,000. Uh, now, this amount will be increasing as the UX designer gains experience, as we can see over here. So by the time we have senior uh, designers, this, um, this would be more than 94 US dollars per year in the United States. And in Mexico, uh, we have 36,000 uh, around that amount per month. And we can see that it, it has actually doubled the initial amount. This is to have a reference. Um, in the United States, this is how we compare the average salary of UX designers versus a graphic designer. So for a graphic designer, it's around $41,000 per year and for a UX designer, 74,000. This, um, this is data from 2020. Um, now we had this um, brief insight of UX in the industry. I would like to share with you what happens and in the day-to-day -day of the UX life. So um, we're going to go in there. In a way to spoil a little bit, I will tell you that UX life is a lot about um, creating relationships and building relationships with the people that are around us. So we will be connecting with all these people here. We're going to be working with teammates. We're going to be building relationships with users, customers, or client stakeholders, of course, field experts, visual designers, developers, project managers, and more. And what, what are we going to be doing? So 
what are the activities that a UX designer actually does? We are going to be traveling to faraway places uh, because we need to get into the context of our users. Uh, we actually um, have traveled um, overseas because we, we want to observe users and their context. That is important. So um, in some projects we have detected things that we would not, we would have, um, we wouldn't have detected if we hadn't gone where the users are and see what they are doing, observing their behaviors. That is, uh, that is the main part of this uh, research do that we do, do we do as youth designers. And then we're going to be collecting stories that will help us empathize with those users. Um, we're going to spend time understanding the business because we want to understand their goals. What is their vision? Uh, how is this project helping them achieve those goals? And then find that design uh, opportunity um, around their business and match that with the user needs and goals as well. So we are going to spend time by building artifacts just like this one and you know like journey mapping service blueprinting and artifacts like that we're going to build understanding around users so once we have this insight from the business and the insight from the users we're going to build understanding we're going to be those intermediate um, roles that will help them understand their users and put a face on them so here are some stakeholders building on some proto personas and this is an, an artifact that will help us understand um, our users um, according to what their needs are and what are their goals, what are their pain points and what are their current behaviors around this interaction they're having with their product or service. This is an empathy map. And this is also an artifact that will help us build understanding around our users and by put it, putting us in, into their shoes. We're going to spend time analyzing data, lots of data, because this data will provide us with the insights we need and to identify the right problems to solve. So we are not here to do what the users want. You know, we are here to do what the users need. And to get to those needs, we need to have uh, done that qualitative user research beforehand. And once we have that, then we can come and think of what is the right problem to solve with our solution. And then work together, generating ideas to solve those problems we found. We're going to be using visualization to communicate because this is a low effort, high impact way to do this. And it's very effective and it's, it's easier to memorize. And we're going to build building low fidelity prototypes. We are going to be uh, building these workflows and um, just drafts of how users might interact with our products first before we take them to high fidelity prototypes that will be of course tested and validated with users to see if we are um, addressing the problems correctly. And basically to find out if we are solving the problem right. We're going to collaborate with other team members in person and remotely as well, because now we have coronavirus in the world. And we're going to be thinking strategically about implementation and because our work as UX designers is not finished until someone is out there using what we are designing. So that is why we're using artifacts just as this one, which is a user story map. And here we are just um, prioritizing and finding the right place to implement some features in our products um, based on the impact and the effort. We're going to be learning, always learning, because as you know, technology is something that is changing every day. And there might come um, some different ways to interact with technology tomorrow. So we need to keep up ourselves updated. And we're going to be sharing knowledge as well because that's how we grow as a team. We're going to be having conversations, multiple conversations, um, because that is the way we, we can um, communicate and share. And of course, we're going to have fun. 
So um, this is the design team at Wiseline. I just wanted to give you a sense of, of how, how this feels to be a UX designer. And now that we have talked about that, we're going to go into how, um, how a UX designer look like. So the UX designer, um, when I'm asked about it, what would be a good UX designer? I like to describe it as a curious person. So it would be a person who would be very aware of their world and will notice what is going on and, and will stand up, you know, won't, won't be just there watching what what, whatever he's saying, he would stand up and do some research about it, make questions and try to, to solve those questions and try to improve his or her world. That's what a, a UX designer is in essence. And it's also a person who uses both sides of her brain. So you might have heard of um, this theory of the hemispheres. So I have the left hemisphere of her brain uh, which will help us with all these analytical tasks and will think of numbers and words and it's um, a very concrete approach. And then we have the side, uh, the right side of our brain, which is the creative one, the holistic one, and uh, it's abstract. So we are going to be using both because we are going to be using our right side of the brain to get to insights. Then the left side of the brain to analyze information and we are going to use our right side of the brain again to get to creative solutions but again the left side of the brain will help us now um, analyze and make sure that those solutions are feasible and we're going to be solving everyday problems talking about skills and uh, so here are uh, some of the main technical skills, and let's take of technical skills of, as those that we can improve by reading a book or by taking an online course, by attending a conference. Um, so this doesn't mean that a UX designer needs to have all those skills uh, on point. Actually, a UX designer uh, can specialize on, on them in, in several ways. Uh, so. There could be generalists, of course, a person who covers most of them, um, not that deep. And then it could be a person who is strong in interaction design and visual design, strong in information architecture and in information technologies. And this would be the shape of that designer. We could have another person who is um, more, um, let's say that she has mastered qualitative research and a little bit of quantitative research, human factors, and business strategy and service design. These are just examples, but it's just to show you that uh, th there is a broad range of disciplines and areas inside the UX field. And you can choose uh, whether or not to focus on some of them in order to grow um, and use, of course, the skills that you naturally have. Now, there are also known technical skills. Uh, the ones that I'm listing here in blue are basically those that um, we consider the baseline skills for a UX designer in Wiseline. Um, and this is because uh, we need to be uh, working very closely with our customers that would be collaboration. Of course, we're communicating ideas all the time, ideas, but also insight, data. Um, that is how, how, we, how we work and adaptability also because um, you know it's a changing world this and we are um, being a, we need to be able to adapt to the situations where we are executing for example if we're doing some research um, or if we are now uh, helping a client that is um, under the medicine industry then we need to, to be able to adapt uh, to to our, our, our clients needs and there is also strategic thinking basically because as designers we are um, we are catalyzers we have this active role in which we make things happen we are not just delivering a service 
to our client. So that is important. That's why we have business savviness as well, because we're not just delivering a product or a service. We are uh, becoming a partner of our clients. We are helping them achieve their goals. Um, so that is why business is important. And there are, of course, several other non-technical skills that we, can, we also call um, soft skills that can help us in the, in the way that we are doing our job or, or the specializations that we have chosen so far. So for example, a person who, is, uh, who has decided to become an expert in user research, that person might be using analysis and synthesis. Um, and storytelling, of course. If a person has decided to focus on uh, strategy design, um, service design, that person might need some facilitation skills and, of course, negotiation, uh, critical thinking and lateral thinking. Now, um, that is um, a very, very brief explanation of, of how, it, how it is. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to, to get to the part of questions and answers because, of course, we're going to be um, having more meaningful conversations over there. Uh, but I wanted to recommend you these books. These are basic ones. And well, at least these three are, are really basic ones. And About Face is one that covers most of the methodologies that we are using as UX designers. This is highly recommended. And here are some recommended trainings as well. So in Wiseline, we have this UX certificate program and we had this in the past. Um, now we are going to reopen it next year. So here is the uh, waiting list in case you want to be considered and be sent some information once we have the program um, online, you can uh, use this form to, to register. And there is also the certificate program by Nielsen Norman Group. It is a very complete one. Um, now that we have um, the situation of COVID, you can take it online. It's a little bit expensive, but it's definitely worth it. And Information Design Specialization Program uh, by University of California in San Diego, this is actually very approachable because it is in, in Coursera. It's a specialization, um, which means that you have several courses to take, um, but the instructors are, are really, really, um, good at, at their job and, and their experts and the dynamics that, that they, are, they have in there is, is really good. So um, at this point, we have um, reached the testimonials part of our, our talk. And after that, we will have questions and answers. So by this time, I would like to present um, I would like to introduce you to these um, colleagues of mine. So these are my teammates. They are all senior UX designers in Wiseline. And I invited them to this conference because I, I wanted to, sh to, for, to share with you uh, what is their um, passion about UX, how, how have they, they become a UX designer, and what do they enjoy the most of their jobs. So I don't know if they are already here. Raul, can you hear us? I'm not sure if... Yes, I couldn't oh. mute myself. Great, thank, thank you. you. So um, yeah, I, I think we could start with you. Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you become uh, a UX designer? what is it part of your job that you enjoy the most and what are you working on right now perhaps for sure thank you and uh, thank you everyone for being here i think it's been uh, an amazing walk through ux job thank you clara uh, yeah i can tell you a little bit of of myself uh, originally i'm a industrial designer then i got myself of into business, I can call it business design. I was in charge of an international business office. So I get myself to work a lot on designing new, uh, new businesses. So that helped me a lot understanding the business side and the service design side of, of design. So after that, that experience regarding business, I start getting into the world of, of service design. And after service design, looking through all the journey of, of service, I started identifying the 
the touch points regarding UX and that's where where I fall in love with, with UX and that's what I'm working right now. Uh, what I enjoy the most about being a, a UX design designer is getting the things into the real world, actually seeing how people are are using your your products, how people are actually interacting what with what you do, and also how you you actually solving people's needs or helping them to relieve their pain points. Uh, right now I'm working on, uh, I'm designing a tool for designing tools. So it's kind of uh, not contradictory, but it's really quite a challenge. Uh, it's really interesting working with a, uh, we're working with a big, big clients, a multifaceted team. So we are right now finishing a, a foundation phase. So how we are getting all the research that we did during that phase into an MVP definition and working to define a new product. So thank you for that. Thanks, hello, Raul. Um, okay, now we can continue with Elves. Are you here, Elves? Yes, of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Hi everyone. Sure. Hi everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Clara. And as she mentioned, my name is Elva. I am a senior UX designer and I landed this work um, or job, better said, after studying industrial design, just as some of my colleagues here go industrial design. <laughs> and um, I started with an internship in another company and I was more of a visual designer. And once they asked, if I was able to redesign a web page, which was used internally for them. And I was like, yeah, sure, of course, I'm a designer. Of course, I can design anything. I was a little bit um, lying because I had no idea how to redesign web pages whatsoever. So I started digging deeper and this happened like three or four years ago. Um, so UX design was super fresh. Right now it's just fresh. Uh, so I started digging and understanding what it was all about. Um, I started the redesign and it was a complete success. So they say they, they kept on giving me those kind of, of geeks and it made me really happy. That's why I found out that UX design was the, the path to follow. And um, yeah, so that is something that I really like about this job as a UX designer. It's not only what Raul already mentioned on knowing that you're solving people's problems, but also um, knowing that there's always something new to learn. Uh, it doesn't matter how many times I, I am in these academies, I always learn something new for our discipline and that's marvelous. And um, also I have a lot of fun with my team. So that's also a huge plus. And today I am designing a um, platform for a service from a client in the US that is, um, helping people get legal assistance and guidance. So that's quite interesting. You also get to know to understand that business in specific and it's um, also for gun control. So that's a very niche kind of topic. And uh, besides that, I'm also a mentor for a couple of designers in our team. I am also part of the hiring committee and I am also the product owner of an internal tool, tool that used to help us reduce food waste in our offices prior the pandemic, of course. <laughs> right now we're giving it a uh, spin-off so that it supports the food delivery um, inside Guadalajara. So it's, it's pretty, pretty awesome, my day-to-day. -day. And that's me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elves. Um, Arthur, are you on the call? We would like to hear from you as well. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome, thank you, Clara. And thank you to the almost 90 people who joined this, this session. It was great to, uh, to see the questions and answers that we have come up with. It's really great to see the interactions. My name is Arturo Rios. I am a senior UX designer at WiseLine. I've been at WiseLine for almost three years. And as some of my team members, I also have an industrial design background. And uh, like six years ago, I was designing a physical product, which was a robot for children to start uh, 
to learn programming at early stages. So I designed the case and the remote control and everything that was like phys physical and tangible. And the engineers at that time were the ones who designed the interface of the control. So I thought that that was not my job. I'm an industrial designer. I shouldn't care about that digital experience. And it turned out that the experience was really, really bad. Children would not understand how to control the robot. So at that point, I realized that if I wanted to have a great impact in the world, I should care a lot about not only my discipline, but other disciplines as well. So that's how I got into UX with some courses and books and following people. And now we're here. And one of the things that I enjoy the most about uh, being a designer is that you apply a product design mindset to a consulting industry in our case. So you have to learn a lot about different industries and verticals and products in such a short amount of time. Become an expert because you are going to design for a lot of people. So you really want to make informed decisions and also to communicate and collaborate with other people. There's like this myth that designers are the only ones who solve problems. I believe that our discipline is defining those problems, then working with multidisciplinary teams to solve those problems together. And that's how really great ideas uh, come into place. And right now I'm working for a very famous company for uh, a mouse and a castle. And we are redesigning their digital management system. Everything around movies and series and billboards and subtitle text. We are managing that experience. So it's a great challenge in terms of information architecture because we have to deal with a lot of data, but it's a really good uh, experience so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. Um, thanks for sharing all that. And finally, we have Mike Villa on the call. Can you hear us? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Well, um, thanks. And thanks, everybody. And uh, different to my folks, I study graphic design. So since I study graphic design, I was... Um, thinking that uh, in the future I want to be uh, working for a uh, game industry and creating some characters and, and yeah, creating all the things related to, uh, to the game. Then I was to start uh, working, um, first of all, as a web designer, and then I start uh, switching to a UI UX uh, with this uh, big boom about the, the iPhone and everybody wants to have their own application, their own website. Uh, you start uh, working as a web designer and creating the interface and a little bit of code, um, HTML and CSS. Uh, well, and at that time, uh, some pages in Adobe Flash. And then I transition a little bit to some uh, 3D animations and modeling, and then uh, to, uh, 2D animation, traditional animation. And then I, I jump to UI UX because I really like to, to create, uh, as Clara mentioned, these uh, two sides of the brain. Uh, one is to uh, thinking about solving the problem and the other one creating an, uh, an amazing solution for, for an, a particular thing. So I think that uh, is the thing that I, I really like the most. Um, uh, right now in, in Wiseline, I am a senior uh, UX designer. I've been here um, for the past one year and a half, I think. And yeah, the thing that I really enjoy the most is uh, besides to working with my co-workers that are pretty amazing and inspiring, uh, you can learn, uh, learn a lot of things, but is, is that, that uh, mixing uh, both things about the, the UX and the UI uh, and all the things that they mentioned to understand the, the idea from the business, working with the client, doing some workshops, uh, empathize with them and to understand the idea that they want to um, to have and then empathize with the user that is the uh, the final uh, target that we, we want to uh, to achieve 
and then walking through all the pro uh, all the process at the beginning uh, from the beginning to the end to uh, to give an a solution or or an, a proposal for the user to start testing and iterating because it's an iterative process uh, yeah all, all those things I, I really enjoy uh, and yeah to all of you uh, UI UX uh, rather than uh, if you select uh, the UX or the UI path uh, it's an pretty uh, amazing experience uh, and yeah learn, learn a lot of things and start uh, working for different companies right now I'm working for an uh, as well big company uh, well uh, I don't know we can call it FOX, like a, and a code name. And I'm working um, to an internal team because they start switching their uh, streaming process video to transforming all the uh, backend solutions. And we need to, uh, to build new interfaces to connect all the things backend and the front end. And then how the internal people will start manage all the um, control for the listing in the uh, online and um, uh, streaming applications that they have. So yeah, it's pretty amazing to work with uh, uh, different people from different sites, not only uh, UI UX designers. You know, uh, it, it, it's kind of uh, interesting to, to work with the CEOs, uh, the managers, uh, the dev team. So it's a pretty, pretty amazing experience. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. And thank you, Arthur, Raul, Elves, uh, also for being here and sharing this with us. Um, now we are moving to the part of the questions and answers. I'm going to st stop, start uh, sharing my screen again. Um, this is how it will work. Um, so I asked Elves to take note of uh, those questions that were interesting on in the chat. I have already had the chance to, to read some of them and I can see that some of them are very interesting. So I would like to um, ask her to uh, guide us through this, through this um, questions and answers section. What are the, those questions that are still unsolved? Because I can see that some of them have already been solving them. And, and also please feel free to in, in, include or add more questions in the chat as we are talking and having this conversation. Uh, I would invite my, my partners to uh, be online and to just to um, help me solve or answer any question if you'd like. And there are also some wasteliners over here that can help us make this conversation um, more rich for everyone. So um, yeah, let's, let's start. Sure. So um, also, just a small PSA for everyone. Remember in the chat that I told you that there was a surprise coming. So thank you everyone for bearing with us till the very end. Um, it's got to do with a book. So that's all I'm going to say right now. Stay with us. <laughs> okay, so the first question that kept unsolved was by Alfonso Parra. And it was when you were talking about usability testing, um, Clara and how all of this was impacting the market, especially that now a lot more people are forced to stay indoors. Um, I'm assuming that this is also related on how all of these testings are held now that a lot of people cannot go outside, if I'm not mistaken, Alfonso. All right. Okay, he says yes. <laughs> okay, um, a great question. Actually, um, coronavirus is something that had affected uh, several aspects of our work because it's not only how do we conduct usability testing, but it's also how our customers are uh, now having conversations with us and how are we having that collaboration together. And so about usability testing, fortunately, we have remote tools. I mean, tools that help us do it in a remote mode. For example, we have a uh, user Zoom and platforms like that, that uh, help us conduct the usability testing without being in there. Of course, there are some challenges, you know, like the technical level of participants and things like that. So right now we are working on, on ways to, you know, like um, these workarounds, those things, for example, we send them the instructions um, to be using the video conference software and we try to guide them towards this uh, 
this usage of, of the platform um, from from um, while, while using our, our cameras and we're also asking them to mirror their, their phones in the screen, for example, and then share the screen with us. So it's becoming a challenge, an interesting one, but um, fortunately tools are there. And the other uh, aspect of it is that, for example, if we are facilitating workshops with our stakeholders after the research, that is also uh, uh, a, a key part of our process and we need to do it and we need to do it well. So what we are doing is that we're using platforms uh, such as Mural or Miro, and in those platforms we are sharing ideas over digital post-its, <laughs> now that we have to do it that way. And we also make sure that all of them have access and that they are familiar, uh, familiarized with the tool before the sessions and so on. We have, um, I think we have published a couple of Medium articles about, about this, uh, how to do remote collaboration. Uh, in the UX field, so I can share with you the links in a while. Yes, super. Thank you, Clara, for that. Um, an additional question from Alfonso as well was how to measure success when you are in this part of the discovery of the business um, phase, if you may. Okay. Um, it is part of our job to make our clients successful. So what we do is that depending on the nature of the project, we define a set of KPIs, which are key performance indicators. And those are aligned with their strategy. So let's say that a key performance indicator will be um, the number of, um, of clients that use the website to register. It's just an example. And we're going to uh, measure that once we are evolving in the design and in, in the implementation to see how the how customers are reacting to that. And we have several tools. For example, there's one called the funeral analysis. And the funeral analysis will tell us at which part of our process, of our delivery process, uh, users are being stuck. For example, if you have a website where users need to register before uh, purchasing an item, then you will have um, this data of how many users are entering the website, and that would be at the top of your funnel. And then you would go down. So from all those who entered your website, some of them actually um, put an item in, a, in, in their shopping cart. So that would be how the funnel gets reduced. And from all of them, some drop their shopping cart and some of them continue to the purchasing process. And as we are going to measure all of those um, all of those uh, points in the funnel, at the end, we're going to be able to make decisions of where the problem is, what can we do to get it better. And there is also something called the UX ROI, return of investment. Um, that is a way that we can communicate with our clients because they are familiar with those terms. And in terms of UX, we can actually tell them how much money would they be saving or how much money would they be earning if they invest in the solutions that we are proposing? Um, so there are ways to do that, actually. But in the, the short answer is uh, by using KPIs and measuring them as we go. Awesome, great. Um, we have another one. Uh, this one is from Fernanda Fonseca, and actually I could see that all of her questions were kind of related. First, she asked, what is visual design exactly? Then if it was exactly as UI, and then she is now mentioning that the term UX UI is kind of uh, wrong. So could you shed a little bit more of light uh, on the differences between these three disciplines? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, let's start with visual design. Actually, um, visual design is, a discipline that covers most of the aesthetics part of the design and most of the branding and how the brand reflects through the interfaces that we are building. And so a visual design will think of attributes, experience attributes and branding attributes that need to be reflected on the final result. Um, actually, I, I think that one of our visual designers is on the call, I don't know if if he can hear us. Emilio, are you there? Uh, 
Hi everybody, here I am. Ah, here it is. So um, Emilio is uh, a uh, lead visual designer in Wildland, and I think that he's the most appropriate person to help us answer that question. Yeah, so thank you very much. Adding on top of what you've already said, I think if I were to um, simplify the, the understanding of visual design as we do at Wiseline um, using skills, I would say that a visual designer um, covers interface design, interaction design, um, information technologies, a lot of systemic design. It also involves brand design to bridge this gap between um, cost, uh, clients or users with the brands we're working with. Um, it touches a lot of illustration, not necessarily in the artistic uh, understanding of illustration, but the ability to um, uh, make diagrams or thoughts or concepts uh, come to life and come to a, a visual expression and a lot of uh, information visualization as well. Um, pretty much we, we work a lot on, on um, making sure that uh, interfaces not only are more usable and uh, are understandable for, for users, but also using uh, attributes that uh, each brand wants to represent and um, take to their customer to form this, this, uh, this special bond with them. So yeah, that's pretty much uh, how it goes. Thank you very much. And well, regarding this question of the difference between UX and UI, well, um, let's say that UI is um, user interface design, is mainly um, a person who will be focusing on the way users who are interacting with a digital platform will be thinking of screens and how the screens will look like while well, a UX designer is a more holistic discipline. And we can say actually that UI are in, is included as one of those disciplines. Some experts uh, have created this um, map of specialties within UX and one of them is very often uh, openly maps, mapped as UI. Uh, so the difference might be that one. UX is about the interaction and the overall perceptions and emotions, not only the digital ones, not only the ones that are strictly related to a screen, while the UI designer is focused on those, those screens, those elements that are a part of the composition and how those elements help the user accomplish their tasks. That would be. Do we have another question okay. over there? Yes, one last one, because I know there are a lot of them and I had to choose. So um, this one comes from Luis Enrique Antiveros, and he's asking, what do you think about the future of the U of UX in Mexico and the importance of the industry? Okay. Um, well, in Mexico, I would say we are behind. Um, it's natural because um, we are third world. Uh, but um, I would say that we are now we are reaching a maturity in these topics, it is not uh, easy uh, to find UX professionals right now. That is the truth. And it's very common to find people who uh, claim to, to have user experience, uh, experience as professionals, but they don't. Um, it's more some kind of um, theory, theoretical knowledge or things that practices that we have been learning from here and there. That is how the world is now. And I would think that for the future, if we talk in the short term, we would be um, acquiring more and more uh, knowledge and, and experience, real experience in these topics. Now with this situation of coronavirus, most companies, or at least more, more companies than ever, are worrying themselves of how can they keep con uh, delivering their services um, through digital channels. So that's a huge opportunity for us because now, um, now there is this need to have those touch points, those digital touch points, and those need to be designed by a UX designer, of course. So I would think that um, we are moving towards there where we are um, building more maturity around practice than theory. And once we get there, then we can have this as a uh, discipline 
that is not only out there in the industry, but that is also uh, talked in the school, for example, in the universities. It's, it's, it's something that might uh, start uh, being teached there. Like, for example, we don't have right now any, any uh, career or professional career that is strictly related to that. You know, we have, um, of course, careers related to the information technologies world in general, any of them, but right now there are some few institutions that are starting um, including UX as part of their programs and I think that that will happen more often in the future and definitely UX is going to be required in most companies as well, not only in the ones that are related to technology. That's my guess. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, it's Kind of uncertain but i think it was just spot on thank you claire those would be all of the questions for now um i invite everyone of you that may have further questions to contact us uh through our social media and we will be more than happy to to answer your questions uh you can follow us on instagram as white line design specifically <laughs> okay Thanks very much, so just to continue the little PSA that I had prepared and before your amazing closure or do you want to close first? Yeah. Um, I actually only have this quote here and okay. uh, this very popular one it says people will forget what you said they will forget what you did but never forget how you made them feel well I, I think that would be it and um, everyone have a good night. Thank you so much Claire it was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you.